seems like we have a good group of people here, so I will get started. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, sounds like I have a pretty stiff competition in terms of a, another session, but I, I really appreciate you all being here. My name is Sherry Sier. I'm a postdoc um, in infectious disease epidemiology at UPenn. And um, I've had a long standing interest and love for spatial data and spatial data analysis. So I'm really excited to be here today to um, talk to you guys about this. <laughs> um, be talking to you guys about, about this topic. Um, so some housekeeping type things. Um, sort of by default, everyone is on mute. Um, but if you'd like to ask a question, um, you can raise your hand and, and I will ask you to go off mute. You'll unmute yourself and then you can ask your question. Or if you prefer, you can um, ask questions straight into the chat. You don't have to wait for any breaks or anything like that. Um, I, I'm very comfortable um, people stopping me sort of midway um, if, if questions come up to, to just ask them. Um, and please don't be shy because I, I don't really know um, what everyone's background is. So if anything's unclear, um, let, let's pause and, and, and really address it. And I'll try to keep my eye on the chat so I don't miss any questions. Okay, so um, here is an overview of, of our workshop today. We're gonna start by just introducing how R handles spatial data um, and the different spatial data types. Um, and then we'll have a brief introduction to the analysis of spatial health data. And so all of these, um, we'll, we'll start sort of in, in these slides and now is a good time for me to post um, the link to the R Studio cloud that we'll be working out of today. I'm gonna post that straight into the chat. Yes, there, there are materials. You didn't need to uh, read anything beforehand. It's, it's all ready for you on the RStudio cloud. Um, and let me just uh, walk you through the different files we'll be working with today. So the main um, sort of R script file is, is this R markdown file here, spatial analysis. Um, and uh, hopefully it, it's well annotated with um, sort of sort of the, the uh, all the things we'll talk about and, and what all the different functions mean. If you want to see um, this R markdown file all knitted together, you can and go here um, and uh, you can go to these different sections if you want to peek ahead. Um, the slides we'll be talking, we'll, we'll be um, going through will be right here, um, this PowerPoint file. And then there's also this data file that contains all the different data, all the different spatial data that we'll be reading in um, as part of our uh, practicum that, that we're going through today, but I'll, I'll start with just some background um, in, in these slides. Oh, right. I think I was in the middle of, of talking about our overview. Okay. And so then um, we'll talk briefly about um, analysis of, of spatial health data. Um, and, and we'll have two breaks today. We'll take break number one. Um, and then when we actually get into the meat of this workshop, the actual spatial analysis part, we'll be analyzing Lyme disease data from New York State. So we're just going to first um, sort of look at that data, make a map of that data, um, and then we'll do a global clustering analysis with um, the Moran's eye statistic, and that'll be in sort of the R markdown file. We'll take one more break, um, and we'll end with a local clustering analysis with the local Moran's eye statistic. So why should you use R for spatial data analysis? So as attendees of this workshop, I don't think I have to convince you that R has many strengths. Um, and, and same goes for spatial data analysis. And I just wanna start with um, sort of a historical note. There's sort of two different frameworks for handling spatial data and spatial data analysis. Um, historically, it's been through the SP framework, which has formed the backbone of our GIS tools for well over a decade now. Um, so there's so much we can do in, in sort of the SP framework. Unfortunately, it's very clunky and not very intuitive. Um, so uh, several years ago, this SF framework was introduced, which is really great. It's much more user friendly. It's um, compatible with the whole tidyverse, um, which is great. Um, 
but in the beginning, you could really only make maps with it, but slowly, ever, you know, ever so gradually, um, these packages for actual spatial statistics has have been released that that is compatible with SF. So I, I think eventually this SF framework, which is, I think, much cleaner and, and easier to use, is going to completely replace SP. So I mentioned SP just because there's still things you can only do in SP. You're going to see it all over, you know, online documentation about our spatial data analysis and textbooks and things like that. Um, but we're going to work exclusively um, in the SF framework when, when we're going into the practicum file. Um, so I had a question uh, about the, the files being on GitHub. It's not on GitHub right now, but I will upload all of these files to GitHub um, in the next day or two. But I, I have the link that I will eventually um, load the files to on GitHub as the last slide of this PowerPoint. And um, another question about um, can we work in the workspace asynchronously? I believe you can. Um, go through this, uh, the R markdown file on your own and, and run that code. So, so you should be able to run that, um, you know, you can even save it um, and, and, and run it at a different time. That, that should be fine. Okay. And the advantages of performing geospatial analysis are in R compared to something like ArcGIS um, is that you know, R is a statistical package. Um, so it's sort of the gold standard for, for running statistical analysis and the same goes for spatial statistics. Um, and it also has an impressive graphics engine. So in addition to spatial analysis, you can make really beautiful maps that, that are highly customized to, to whatever needs you might have. Um, our focus today will be not on mapping, which I saw was the topic of a different workshop, but more on the analysis portion. And of course, our um, it, you know it's a command line interface, um, and it it's uh, you can save your script files, um, so it's it's really great for for reproducible data um, that that you can share with others, and then they can sort of check your analysis, things like that. Um, so we'll get started talking about the different types of spatial data. So two broad categories: one is vector data. Um, that, that's one big all-encompassing category. Um, and then the other that, that's different from vector data is raster data. So under the umbrella of, of vector data, we have points, point data, line data, and, and polygon data. Um, and luckily these things sound are, are exactly what they sound like. Point data are, are just points in space. Um, uh, so each point is associated with an X and a Y coordinate. If you're dealing with 3D coordinates, you can have X, Y, and Z. Um, lines uh, are points um, where you specify the order that, that you want um, the points to be connected to each other to form lines. Um, so, so that's what line data is composed of. And then finally, polygon data also includes these different geo coordinates, these different points. But um, when you uh, specify the sequence to, to connect the points together, it's going to close back in on itself and, and eventually form these polygons. Um, and in contrast to vector data, oh, we'll, we'll get to vector data or raster data um, in, in the subsequent slides. Uh, I, I want to first give some examples of these three different vector data types. So point data, we can look to um, just the locations of, of, of specific uh, incidents. So you, we could look at the locations of shootings. Um, so, so this is all the locations of shootings um, that occurred in Philadelphia, that's where I am, um, in 2017. Um, an example of line data. Um, so all of these examples are, are from local, where, where I am locally, which is Philadelphia. Um, we can look at all the bike accessible roads in Philadelphia. Um, and so you can see all of these lines that represent the different road segments that include a bike lane um, here in Philly. And then finally, an example of polygon data um, would be census tracts. So we can see all of these individual census tracts. Um, so each census tract is its own polygon. And now um, we can talk about raster data. And unlike uh, vector data, which represents these, um, these points, um, whether you're connecting the points or, or you're not connecting the points, these points can be sort of anywhere in space. Um, raster data um, 
the data is stored in a grid of cells, in a regular grid of cells. And so a very simple schematic of raster data would be um, this uh, rectangular set of cells here. Um, so this is a common way to store elevation information. Um, satellite imagery is another example of raster data because you can think of each pixel being uh, its own cell. Um, so here, um, the, the way that I'm, I'm showing these cells, um, let's say that this is elevation um, and these colors represent um, for very dark colors, low elevations and light colors, um, high elevation. So what you can see sort of simply shown by this um, example raster is, is um, some kind of hill or mountain, depending on, on how high this point is. And some examples of raster data, um, again, from Philadelphia. Here's a satellite image of Philadelphia from Google Earth. Um, and here's a pretty cool raster of the land use um, classification um, that was performed, I, I believe this is a, a 50, a meter by 50 meter, each cell is a 50 meter by 50 meter um, cell, um, which represents uh, an actual uh, square in, in physical space. And within each cell, um, these values for the cell gives you whether what the land cover on the cell is tree cover, grass, shrubs, bare earth, water, buildings, roads, other paved. So th these um, classifications might be useful to you as a health researcher, depending on maybe you're interested in, in green space, or maybe you're interested in um, heat trapping um, that, that might happen when, when you're around buildings and roads and things like that. So finally, um, now that we've gone over all of these different GIS data types, um, we need to talk about how these types of data are handled by R. So again, just as a historical note, in the SP framework, these four different data types were stored um, in these um, spatial star data frame objects. So points are spatial points data frames, lines are spatial lines data frames, et cetera. Um, in the SF framework, um, well, I'll start by saying that um, SF can't have handle raster data. So when you're working with raster data, um, you either work in the SPRE framework or you just work with it as a, as a matrix. Um, but for these vector data types, all of these are going to be stored as an SF object. Um, and then you can specify the geometry type. Um, so for points, there'll be a multi-point SF object. Lines will be a multi-line stream object, and polygons will be a multi-polygon object. And um, when whether you're talking about an SP or an SF object, that object, um, and we're going to see this in the practicum, is going to have both spatial attributes and data attributes. So the spatial attributes um, are, it's going to contain three important elements. One is the actual geo-coordinates. Um, so this will be, you know, all of your X, Y coordinates. Um, so for these polygons, it's going to be all the vertices of each polygon. Um, it's also going to include um, boundary information. So what are the uh, minimum X, minimum and maximum X boundaries and the minimum and maximum Y boundaries. And it's also going to include uh, projection information. Um, and and for the data attributes, um, if, if you have any familiarity of R, you're, you're going to be happy to see that it, it's going to just be a simple data frame. So you're going to have um, rows um, and columns to store information about the different variables pertaining to each one of your rows. So in this example, um, I'm, I'm showing you the census tracts for Philadelphia. Um, and when you go to the spatial attributes, you'll see that there's 384 distinct polygons that are stored as part of the spatial attributes. And each one of these polygons is going to be associated with a row in your data frame. So, um, you know, the, the data attributes, the, the different variable, um, the values uh, for, for this first census tract will be stored in, in this first row. And now we can head over to the practicum. Um, 
And we'll start with this first section on uh, the spatial data overview. So um, we're going to work exclusively in the SF framework today. So that's you're going to have to load the SF library. Um, and then within our data folder, um, we have all the different census tracts for Philadelphia, which we just looked at on the slides. And if you do the class function, you can see that um, this, this uh, Philly tracks um, object is an SF object, and it's also considered a data frame. Um, and because um, I, I mentioned that SF objects are, are very user friendly, um, they can be handled like data frames. Um, so what I mean by that, if you run <clears throat> the stir command, um, which allows you to see the structure of a data object, um, you can see that it's going to give an output similar to what you'd expect from, um, from a data frame. So you have all of these different variables, all of these different columns, but then you also have this geometry portion so that your spatial attributes are going to be stored here. Um, and we can see the first few rows of um, our, our census tracts. And you can see that each row is going to be associated with a specific census tract. So this first row is census tract 94. Um, you can also view the dimensions um, of, a, of the SS object, and it's giving you the dimensions of the data frame. And you can use um, familiar subsetting commands to, for example, select the first row. Um, so again, that's going to give you back census track 94, um, and it's all its um, affiliated information. We can also select columns by name, and I, I'm including um, this head command um, within selecting this column by name, just so that um, it doesn't blow up the uh, the markdown uh, knit, knit file. Um, and you can see the first six um, census tract names um, listed here, and you can do the same um, using a column subsetting. And if you wanted to extract just the spatial attribute of um, the Philly tracks object, we can use this st underscore geometry command. Um, so we're gonna store that output as ptgeo. And um, if we take a look at ptgeo, we'll see that it is in fact a, a multi-polygon. And if you wanted to get um, the spatial coordinates of, of any one of the polygons, you can index it the way you'd index a list. Um, so if you wanted to get the perimeter coordinates for the first census tract, census tract 94, um, you can index it and you can see that these are all of the XY coordinates for that first polygon. Um, and if you wanted to see the data um, associated with this first polygon, you can go back to your PTSF object, take that first row um, and, and get that information. And if you wanted to do the same for the second, poly the second polygon, the second census tract, um, you can get the coordinates again um, using um, subsetting the, the second polygon in our PTGO um, multi-polygon. Um, and we can get uh, the data attributes um, from the second row of our SF object. And um, what's nice is you can use the base plot command uh, for uh, um, a spatial attribute. Um, so the multi-polygon, the PTGO, you can, you can plug straight into a plot command. You don't have to specify anything in, in particular. And it's going to give you a very simple map of the different census tracts in Philly. Um, and just as a bonus, there are some things you can tweak in the space plot command. You can color your polygons, um, this lemon chiffon yellow. Um, you can also um, increase the, uh, the perimeter, the, the line. You can make the lines um, thicker with this LWD. Um, I think it stands for like line weight, something like that. Um, and you can make that line red 
So you can do something silly like that. Okay, um, so that's an example of polygon data. Um, let's go on to um, some line data. So now we're gonna look at that um, bike network um, that, that I showed you all uh, an image of in, in the slides. So we're going to go ahead and read this um, and you can read a shape file. Okay, so I'll, I'll take a step backwards and talk to you about reading in shape files. Um, so this kind of is a little beyond the scope of, of our discussion today, um, but just as a bonus, let's go into the data folder. Um, and this bike network shape file, I downloaded straight from Open Data Philly, um, which, uh, has a lot of publicly available data sets specific to Philly. And when you download a shape file, it's a little bit confusing because you end up seeing uh, multiple files listed all together. Um, often you, you, you download it from, from whatever source you're downloading it from and you have to unzip it. And once you unzip it, all of these other files pop out. Um, and it can be confusing at first because you're not sure which, which one's the file, which one do I read? Well, um, don't panic. Uh, what you can do um, if you want to read a shape file as an SF object, you can just use this very simple st read command. You go to the file path that your all of these different um, shape file uh, files are, are being kept under, and then you name specifically the .shp object. They should all have the same name, but with um, different letters after the period. Um, but you you want to make sure it's you write the one in your code that that's point shp and and that's going to read it in um, as an sf object and um just as a side note the reason that these full these files are so weird is um the, the shape file format was developed originally for arcgis which which handles data a little bit differently um, than r and if we want to double check that we did, in fact, um, read in um, read in the shapefile as an SF object. We can use the class function again and, and see that, indeed, it's an SF object. And all SF objects are also data frames, so that's why you see um, both. Um, and if we wanted to, once again, get just the spatial attributes of, of this um, bike network SF object, we can run the um, st geometry function. Um, and now when we index, let's index a second line segment, um, we can see that it's a line string. So now it's just two different points and this order, I mean, I guess it doesn't matter when, when it's just two points, but um, it, once you connect these two points, that's going to form um, your, your line of interest. And um, if we wanted to see, um, the line segment, um, the, the data associated with that line segment or road segment, we can go to the second row in, um, in our SF object. And we can see that it's this street, this segment um, on Bartram Avenue. And finally, we can again um, pass the, um, the, date, the uh, spatial attribute of our SF object directly to the plot function and that's going to give us a simple plot of all the all the roads with a bike lane in Philadelphia. And finally, um, our final vector data example, we're going to look at point data. Um, so now um, this is not a shape file. this is an SF object that I've already converted. Um, so I, I stored it in our data folder um, as a .rds file, which is a native R file, um, just to save time. But I, I did want to give one example of, of reading in a shape file. Um, and you can see that it's, it's very easy to do um, it using the SF library. So, OK, let's just read in this crime data. Um, let's We can type in crime, um, and it'll tell us that um, it's a simple feature, which is what SF stands for. It's an SF object, um, and the geometry type is a point. So it's a, a multi-point object. Um, and you can confirm that it's an SF um, using the class function. Uh, we already viewed the first few rows um, of crime, and um, I'm just going to plug crime directly into the st geometry function. 
um, to get those spatial attributes and we can plot it. Um, you can ignore this warning. Um, and we can see that these are all of the crime incidents that um, I think this is September 2017. So that's maybe too many points for, for I, our eyes to process. Um, so we can take a look. Um, we can look at, let's take a close look at the um, this crime data. You can see that uh, longitude, we have the longitude, latitude, uh, we have the location, um, dispatch date and time. Um, and then the one I want to take a closer look at is the offense type. Um, so you can see the first 10 are all recovered stolen motor vehicle. So let's see what, what type of um, offense types we, we have available for us. So we can run the simple table command, and now we have a one-way table of all the different offense types. Um, and when I was reviewing these, I, I just wanted to select some things that sounded interesting. So um, I picked out homicide, criminal, and fraud. So um, now we're using um, tools in the tidyverse. So this one is specifically a dplyr function, um, which has this nice filter command. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to take um, crime, and this is often, um, or this is this is a, a function. Dplyr functions are are meant to work on data frames, um, and, and the reason I included um, these dplyr functions for this crime data, um, we saw that you know this crime data has um, th these uh, this spatial attribute, but it can also be handled by by these dplyr functions, which is used for data frames, and, and, it, and it will behave appropriately. It'll behave like a data frame, so we can. Um, use this dplyr filter function to um, filter by offense type. So now we've selected only those rows and only those points that are associated with um, a criminal homicide. And um, this line of code is going to filter just for those crime incidents that are um, instances of fraud. Um, and just as sort of a sanity check, you can see that even if you filtered using this dplyr command, you, you've still kept the spatial attribute. So we still have this SF um, in, in our class type for, for these objects that we filtered out from, from the uh, entire crime database. And now we can um, plot the locations of homicides. Um, and you can see that they're kind of distributed like that. Um, and then, Looking at this might not give you a lot of information because where where what do these points mean? Um, so you can plot um, these specific crime incidents um, on top of our our census tracts. So what I'm running here, we start by plotting we start by plotting um, the Billy census tracts. We layer on top of the census tracts the instances of fraud, which we've colored blue. So all of these blue dots are instances of fraud in Philadelphia. Um, all these dots in red um, are uh, criminal homicide inc incidences. And we can add um, a legend explaining, you know, that that the the points that are blue are fraud and the points that are red are, are homicide. So this is a very simple um, map that that we just made. Um, and finally, um, we'll look at a very, very simple example of a raster. Um, so this uh, raster um, data um, is stored in the data sets library. We have a question. There are equivalent plots in ggplot. I, I um, intentionally left off ggplot today because I wanted to save us time to talk about the actual spatial analysis. Um, but since there is some interest in ggplot, when, when I originally made this practicum um, for, for a class that I taught, um, I, I included these same maps with ggplot code. Um, so when I do upload this to, uh, to GitHub, I'll, I'll be sure to plop all of that code back on. So you, you can see how, how to make an even prettier map on, on ggplot. All right. Um, so here's a very simple example of um, a raster data set, which is stored in the data sets library. Um, and you can see um, 
in this case, the, this raster is just a matrix. Um, and we can peek at this volcano. Uh, let's see. And you can see it's just this matrix, um, and each cell has, has some value. Um, and, and again, this is um, elevation values. So it's, it's uh, sort of uh, similar to, to the um, toy example I showed in the slide. And if you run the stir command, you can see that um, it's a matrix uh, of 87 by 61 matrix. And um, using the filled contour function, um, if we can specify the, the color scheme that we want, we can view um, this volcano. And you can see it is in fact a volcano because um, if you look at this color legend, we have our highest elevation sort of along the rim of the volcano and then the elevation goes down when, once you get to the middle. Okay, so those are all the different spatial data types that you can work with in R. Um, and now we're gonna jump back to the slides and talk about how we can analyze some of the spatial data. So broadly speaking, when we're talking about spatial analysis in general, what we're looking for is evidence of spatial patterns. Um, and, and when we're talking about health data, we're really interested in spatial patterns of disease risk or incidence. And the reason we care about there being a spatial pattern in disease risk or incidence is if they're present, it may support um, specific etiologies. Because if we have a, a cluster of, of cancer hotspots, um, a cluster of, of cancer cases in a specific area, you, you might be suspicious that there might be an environmental hazard. Um, and of course, if you have clustering of cases that that's, that can also signal that, that this process is infectious. Um, and the reason why cases are clustered is because people are transmitting it to each other. So people who live close together um, are, are more likely to, to transmit the disease to each other. And um, if we wanted to investigate the presence of spatial patterns in a formal way, we're, we're going to need to rely on spatial statistics, which we'll dip our feet in today. Um, and spatial epidemiology, which is a, a field that, that I um, very much um, want to be a part of, uh, involves um, the application of spatial statistics to, um, to spatial health data. And it also involves, um, usually the first step is to visualize that spatial data through mapping. Um, so uh, usually that the mapping comes first because you want to explore your data um, and, and then you, you run sort of the formal statistics. And when we talk about spatial patterns, um, let's begin by talking about a lack of spatial patterns. So what does that mean? A lack of spatial pattern means that the occurrence of whatever outcome of interest is happening randomly over space. So if we conceptualize space in a, in a very um, simple way, just sort of as a simple grid, um, the idea is that the probability of an outcome occurring at any grid is going to be constant across the grid. And the incidence of um, the outcome in one grid is going to be independent of all other grids. And specifically, it's going to be independent, uh, or more, most importantly, it's going to be independent of um, neighboring grids. So the fact that um, a case occurred um, in this grid um, is not going to impact whether or not a case occurred in the surrounding grids. So this is an example of a random spatial pattern. And another way of saying a random spatial pattern is that you have no spatial autocorrelation. Um, so this might jump out at you as being a non-random pattern. Of course, you have all of your cases in one half of your grid and no cases on the other half of your grid. Um, and we call this kind of situation positive spatial autocorrelation. Um, and you can think of positive spatial autocorrelation as it's as if your positive cases are attracting all the other, other the, the surrounding grids to be positive themselves. So having a case in this grid makes it, uh, well, in this case, uh, perfectly probable that uh, cases will occur in, in these surrounding grids. And in the case of 
uh, negative spatial autocorrelation. So when you first look at this grid, you, you see that it's very regularly arranged. You might think of this almost as a, a random pattern, but you see, in fact, it, it's not random. I just used the word regular to describe it. Um, so this is an example of negative spatial autocorrelation. And what happens here is that the, the presence of, of a positive case um, makes these sur surrounding, um, these bordering cells, um, much less likely of being cases themselves. So there's here you have um, an attractor force, and here you have sort of, you can think of it as a repelling force. And I, I wanted to find examples of both positive and negative spatial autocorrelation in health data, but it turns out um, in, in the real world, what, what we tend to see and what we care about is positive spatial autocorrelation. So here's an example of positive spatial autocorrelation. And, and I'm, I might just, um, just talk about spatial autocorrelation more generally and just mean positive spatial autocorrelation for the rest of, of these slides, just because there, there's so few examples of, of negative spatial autocorrelation when we're talking about health data. So here's an example of spatial autocorrelation. Um, we're looking at county aggregated heart disease death rates um, between 1999 to 2003. And you can see that um, areas with high uh, rates of heart disease death tend to be clustered um, in, in these counties in the South. Um, so as I said, the reason we care about positive or the reason we care about, about spatial trends or spatial autocorrelation when it comes to, to health outcomes is it's suggesting some sort of underlying etiology. In this case, it, it may be um, shared lifestyle factors um, for, for these counties um, in, in this region of the country. And um, now let's, let's talk about uh, uh, a subject that you may be sick of hearing about, which is COVID, um, which is of course an, an infectious etiology. Um, and like I mentioned, when we talk about infectious diseases, we often see um, spatial trends in, in uh, infectious disease incidents. So here I'm showing um, seven day average COVID positivity um, very early in the pandemic, early April, 2020. And you can see in, in this early stage, we had um, this pocket, this, this hot spot of COVID sort of in the New York uh, metro and surrounding areas. Um, uh, in Louisiana, um, as well as Georgia. This is where, I don't know if you remember in the news, um, a two very large funerals occurred um, late February um, and it became a super spreader event um, and, and led to this part of, of Georgia be, being an early hotspot, uh, early hotspot for COVID. And then a few months go by um, and now you see that New York City is, is no longer a hotspot. And now the hotspot is sort of all of these places in the South and, and Southwest. And then by November, um, COVID has really spread across the, the US, um, but now it particularly hit the Midwest the hardest, which had been had relatively lower rates early on in the pandemic. So um, I, I took these screenshots just, just to show you um, how, especially when you consider um, uh, incidents, um, cases of, of infectious disease are often spatially correlated. And if we go back to our different GIS data types, um, we can sort of contextualize them um, with regard to health research um, with, with these examples. So um, when we're talking about points data, uh, a common example that you'll see in, in the health literature is um, when you have um, electronic health record data, or if you have um, registry data where you have the actual uh, locations, the residential addresses for your patients, and, and even better yet, if you have a control population that you also have um, spatial information on. Um, and when you have the locations of cases and controls, you can run um, a spatial GAM model, which will allow you to identify disease um, hotspots. An example of uh, line data that you might see in the health literature, um, a, a very uh, common um, 
line data um, that, that health researchers care about are linear polluting sources like three ways. Um, so in, in this uh, paper that, that I, I've um, listed here, um, these authors were interested in the association between asthma exacerbations and proximity, residential proximity to major freeways. Um, and not surprisingly, um, they, they did find that as you live closer to, to a highway, um, you are more likely to experience adverse um, outcomes with, with your asthma. And today we'll be focusing on polygon data. Um, and uh, we're going to be looking at um, regional uh, rate data. So polygon, but what I mean by regional count or rate data, so if, if we were talking about um, counties or, or census tracts at, as our polygons, if for each census tract or county or state, we have um, some numerical value um, that, that we've sort of aggregate, like aggregately measured for, for um, that area. So today we're going to be looking specifically at county aggregated uh, Lyme disease incidents um, for the state of New York. And um, the reason I don't include a literature example here is because we're going to be doing this ourselves in the practicum. We're going to be looking for um, global um, spatial heterogeneity um, in Lyme disease incidents in New York state. And we're also going to try to find um, local clusters where um, incidence rates are higher than one would expect under the null hypothesis of, of no spatial trends or lower than one would, one would expect or, or cold spots um, for Lyme disease incidents. And then finally, examples of, of raster. Um, you could have rasters of a health-related exposure. So um, the... Uh, NASA, um, one of their satellite instruments, um, puts out a estimate of pollution of PM 2.5 and, and, and other, other pollutants um, that you can find sort of as a raster um, for the entire globe. And so you have information about some health-related exposure like pollution um, across a, a grid of cells. And now you can associate that exposure um, with um, perhaps where people live, um, the location of specific cities with outcomes that you have, so you can associate these exposures to, to different health outcomes. And, and I, I, I list an example of, of this here where um, the authors used a raster um, that, that they created, a PM 2.5 specifically associated with wildfires, um, and they associated that exposure with um, the incidence of, of various health outcomes for different cities um, that they linked uh, to, to their exposure profile using that raster. And now we've reached our, our first break. Um, so I'll give us about 10 minutes. Um, we'll um, start again at 427. All right, I hope you enjoyed your break. Um, we're gonna jump right back into our slides um, to talk about how we assess for, for spatial trends um, in, in our health data. So yeah, as a reminder, um, the goal of spatial statistics is to assess for significant spatial patterns or trends. Um, and then we do that with, with hypothesis testing. Okay, so I, I have a question about the bike data, that there are um, over 5,000 line streams in the data, but each string has more than two pairs of coordinates. Um, so yes, that these points, so when, when there's only two points, it's a straight line. Um, and that, this is a great question um, because it's not really the mathematical definition of a line because lines can also be like rivers um, where you have many different points because they're they're jaggedy but they're they're all connected to each other. Um, so so in in the world of spatial data, what what we mean by line is a series of points. It can be two or more or a thousand even um, 
as long as they're all connected in, in a single line, we, we call that a line object. That, that's a great question. So um, there are, of course, some streets that are, are straight, um, in which case it can be represented by just two geocoordinates. But if you have sort of a jaggedy street, you have um, like a fork or something like that, then, then you're going to need uh, more than two points to represent it. So um, back to spatial hypothesis testing. Um, very broadly speaking, there are two different hypo hypothesis, two different types of hypothesis tests. Um, one is um, a test of a global trend, and, and what you do there is, is you're looking for evidence of um, global spatial heterogeneity. Um, so, so in in the case of a global test, you're going to have just a single test statistic, um, and and it's going to to either be significant or it's or it's not. So you're either going to have a global um, spatial heterogeneity or or you're not. But you but you're not going to have um, you're not going to be able to make any inference about um, the locations of like specific um, disease clusters. Um, it, it's really whether or not there's a global trend or not. Um, if you were interested um, in assessing uh, for the presence of, of specific clusters, if you want to point to the area on your map and, and say, oh, that's a hot spot or that's a cold spot, then what you're going to need is a local test. Um, so we're going to start with, with uh, the global test. Um, mm -hmm. And what, when you're assessing for a global trend, then um, you're, uh, you're, you're really um, you're, you're looking to, to test a, for or against a null hypothesis of constant risk across your study area. And so what a constant risk hypothesis is um, under the null condition is that your disease risk is going to be constant throughout your entire study area. Um, so this is very easy to, to think about if, um, well, let's say we're talking about polygon data um, if we're talking about different counties and, and, and um, disease within uh, uh, between the different counties, if you have the same population at risk, you have the same a number of people in each county, then um, under the constant risk hypothesis, you would expect disease counts to be the same for, for every one of your counties. It gets just a little bit, bit more complicated, um, the, the more real world situation where you, you're going to have differences in, in your population at risk. You're not going to have exactly the same number of people living in all your different counties. Um, so in that situation, um, a, an easy solution um, would be to, instead of looking at disease counts, you're, you're going to be looking at population normalized rates. So you're going to divide your disease count or, or your incidence count by the total number of people um, um, who are at risk. Um, and we're going to look specifically at one way that we can assess for, for um, global spatial heterogeneity, and that's with the Moran's I statistic. Um, so the statistic itself is a measure of global spatial autocorrelation, um, and there are um, ways to assess the significance. It's, it's usually through permutation testing, through Monte Carlo simulations. Um, and if we find that this Moran's I statistic is much larger um, than, than any of our simulations that we simulated under the null hypothesis of, of constant risk across our different polygons, um, then that's going to be evidence of spatial heterogeneity. And if um, our Moran's I statistic falls well within um, the distribution from that, that we get from our simulations, then um, that p-value is not significant and, and we fail to reject our null hypothesis. And um, this is not meant to be a math or stats workshop, but I, I do want to um, for us to take a quick peek at the Moran's I formula. Um, I, I liked this uh, image that I took off of Stack Exchange. Um, because it very clearly delineates the different parts of the formula, um, the parts that we don't have to worry so much about. So we have this, the inverse of the variance that's just helping us to normalize that we can ignore that. We have another normalization term, uh, we can ignore that. That the, the meat of, of this Moran's I statistic is up here. Um, and so what, what this formula means, so I is, um, is one uh, specific polygon, and then J, J is a second polygon. 
Um, so we're comparing polygons sort of two at a time, and, and we're going to compare um, one polygon and, and its difference from the, the value, so like the incidence rate for, for this first polygon, um, and its difference from the, the mean value sort of across your study area. And then we're going to find that difference um, of, of that incidence with, with our other area. Um, and you'll note that this term is going to be large. Our, statistics, our test statistic is going to be large when these two um, incidence rates for, for our two different polygons are high at the same time. Um, and, and we want um, our Moran's eye statistic, um, we want this, this term to be, to, to be high, for the, the two rates to be high at the same time um, when, when they're close together, because that's sort of the definition of, of a cluster. Um, so like, like I, I'm stating down here, Moran's eye is essentially a weighted covariance function. And we're going to want to find, this is our, our weight term, we're going to want to choose a weight that's going to let us assess whether um, polygons close together are going to take large values at the same time. Um, so the, the next question that I'm trying to tee up for us is um, how, how do we pick our weights so, so that the weights can be um, large when, when um, the polygons are close together? So um, to reiterate, we are interested in seeing if polygons close to e each other tend to have similar values. So the general idea is to give weight to the polygons um, when they're close together. Um, so, so how do we define close together? So there's this concept of, of neighbors. Um, and, and there's different ways that you can define neighbors um, when you're talking about polygons. So here's sort of an example, um, polygons. This is actually New York counties that I clipped um, along this uh, Western edge. And the reason I, I chose these polygons um, is that you can see that some of them are, are kind of weird and irregularly shaped. And you're gonna see how that's going to change how we select our neighbors as we go um, between our different uh, neighbor definitions. So I think I'm starting with what I think is the most intuitive definition of neighbors. Um, it's certainly what I mean by neighbors when I'm talking sort of colloquially. Um, so let's, let's call these uh, polygons in red our index polygon. So we're, we're interested in, in defining neighbors for our two index polygons. So we'll, we'll start with um, this county up here, um, a contiguity-based definition of neighbors. It's, it's simply going to be all the counties that um, are contiguous or touch share border um, with, with this index polygon in red. And when we consider this um, county down here, you can see that these four counties are considered neighbors uh, by this definition because they too um, share uh, a, a border um, with this index polygon. The next commonly used definition um, to, to uh, specify neighbors is a distance-based um, definition. And I'll start by showing you um, what, what we get. So in, in this case, um, we're setting the distance. So it's gonna be our radius. Um, here I've drawn a circle centered around the centroid, which is um, the, the center of mass center of, of, of um, each one of our index polygons. Um, and the radius here is 50 kilometers. And so, uh, a polygon is going to be considered a neighbor of, of this polygon if their centroids lie within 50 kilometers of this centroid of our index polygon. So you can see that in this case, um, this uh, made not too much of a difference in, in what we're specifying as neighbors, except in this case, you can see that um, this polygon here, which doesn't actually share a border, it's so close, um, it's located um, in such close proximity to, to this index polygon that its centroid is going to lie within a 50 kilometer radius of the centroid of our index polygon. 
Um, so it, it too is being included as a neighbor. And you can see something interesting happening down here where again, um, because these polygons are, are small and they're located so close to our index polygon down here, um, even, even though they don't share a border, this centroid is lying well within the 50 kilometer radius of the centroid of this polygon. However, even though this long um, irregularly shaped polygon shares quite a large border um, with this index county, um, it's so long that its centroid lies outside of this 50 kilometer radius. So under this definition, it's not considered a neighbor. And then a final um, commonly used um, uh, criteria for selecting neighbors is to select the K nearest neighbors. And so you have to specify what you want K to be. But the idea is that each polygon, so you'll notice that um, in, in these definitions, each polygon um, can vary in terms of how many neighbors it has. Um, however, in, in this definition, all your polygons are going to have the same number of neighbors. So you're going to specify that number. We're going to just for, for a hypothetical example, we're going to say that that number is four. So each one of the polygons are, are going to have four neighbors, and you're going to select the four based on the four that has the centroids located most close. I'm sorry if you hear, if you hear some whining in the background, that's my dog. Um, the, the four polygons with centroids most close um, to the centroid of your index polygon. So um, up here, we're selecting these four um, counties. Um, and then down here, um, we're selecting these little um, counties that are located close to, to this uh, southern index county. And then when we talk about the contiguity-based definition, um, we can classify that further into um, a Queens case contiguity where um, you can share a border or it's sufficient to even just share a vertex or a point of, of contact versus a Rooks case where you, you want to share at least a, a whole border. Um, so this is sort of a more stringent um, definition of, of a um, contiguity-based neighbor. And this is sort of the, the more lax version of, of the contiguity-based definition. Oh, okay, so we're not taking a break. Um, we're, we're actually going to switch over to our practicum um, and we're going to um, do, do uh, some, some analysis of uh, global, assessing for, for global spatial autocorrelation. Um, but before we jump into um, the, the significance testing, we're, we're going to actually start by exploring our, our spatial data set that, that we're going to be working with. So um, I'm just waiting for my workspace to load. So um, for the rest of, of our workshop, we're going to be working with um, the New York State Lyme incidence data, um, which you can find at this link. It's publicly available at Health Data and Why. Um, and um, just as an aside, when, when you go to this website, we can, we can take a peek at it now. So here is sort of their, um, this is ArcGIS based, their, their map viewer, and you can see how, how they map their data. Um, and when you export this data, when you download it, you'll see that um, it's only available in tabular format. Um, so you, this is just a, a CSV file. Um, and, and so there's some additional steps you would have to take um, to end up with uh, sort of the SF object that I load directly for us here. Um, and so what, that, what those steps are going to consist of, um, you're going to load the CSV as a data frame in R, um, and then you're going to need to find a shape file of um, New, York, New York State counties. Um, and, and this was just through some Googling. Um, oftentimes these um, these political boundaries, it's very easy to find, find shapefiles for um, on the internet. 
Um, so this is uh, gis.ny.gov, um, and you can download the shape file. It's going to download, again, like I said, it's going to be like a zip file. You're going to unzip it. It's going to have all of those weird components, but you can read it um, using the stread command um, in the SF library. And I actually, we're not going to go through the code today um, because I want to um, sort of be, be more, more streamlined in what we talk about. But I, I just want to mention that if, if you are interested in sort of preparing your own spatial data set um, using health data and GIS data that, that you can um, download from the internet or maybe you have access to, to, um, to this kind of data through your work, um, you can see how I sort of started with these raw materials and ended up um, with, with a at, with an SF shape file um, at, at this code here. So you can review that. Um, hopefully it's, yeah, hopefully you, you find it helpful if that's something you're interested in. So we're gonna start again um, by loading our SF uh, package. And this is, like I said, the line data that I've already sort of prepped um, and converted to an SF object. So if you run the class command, you're going to see that it's an SF object. Um, and we can, oops, just in our console, we can take a look at this data and see what we're, see what we're working with. Um, you can see that it's a multi-polygon object um, with all of these different variables. So this first uh, variable is just the name of the county. Um, you're going to have the county FIPS codes. You're going to have um, some information that came from um, health.data.ny.gov. Um, and you can see that um, this, this is sort of the main value that we're, we're going to be, um, this, is, this is the variable that we'll be working with. And uh, the, the sort of data that, that the state has provided tells you that this is Lyme disease incidence per 100,000 people. So like I mentioned, um, our null hypothesis is going to be constant risk a constant disease risk across the different counties. And our counties, um, of course, are going to differ by the number of, of people in them. Um, so to, to sort of compare these, these counts more fairly, we're, we're going to work with this rate, um, which is going to be the incidence per 100,000 people. Um, and so this should be familiar by now. We can use the ST geometry command to get the, the data attribute, or the, sorry, the spatial attribute from our Lyme data and we can use the plot command. And that's just going to plot us um, this nice simple map of, of the different counties in New York. And now, um, so like I, like I said before, mapping is not the focus of our workshop today, but um, it's still important to uh, visualize um, spatial data be before you run analysis of, of it, just, just to see, see what you're working with. And a really awesome, quick way to make an interactive map is using this package called tmap. So we're going to load it now. Um, and I'm going to uncomment this. I commented this um, to knit this R markdown file, because otherwise, um, when, when you have an interactive map in, in your R markdown file, it makes the file super, super large. And I, I was, it wasn't able to fit um, in, in our studio cloud. So that's the only reason it's commented out. And if you go through the HTML, you'll see it's a static map, but um, you can uncomment that um, in, in your code um, as you're following along. And this line of code is important because it's going to set your mapping mode to interactive. And now with just two lines of code, um, so TM shape, you're going to feed the SF object that, that you're working with, and, and, and it's going to contain sort of the, the spatial attribute that this map um, function is looking for. And then with TM polygons, you're just going to select, you're going to name um, the column that you're interested in mapping. Um, so what you're making when you're mapping values of, of polygons, um, just as an aside, you're making a choropleth map. Um, so let's let's view our interactive choropleth map um, when we run this function. And okay, so now we have this nice interactive map. Um, you can see our color legend here is um, going to help us see um, our Lyme incidence rate. 
and so things you know features of a of a interactive map you can zoom in you can zoom out you can pan around um and sort of just default um in in this t map in this tm shape um function is you, you also have this pop-up message so you can select um counties with your pointer and 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 now you can see uh which um which county you're in and you can see the lime incidence rate for that county so I, I just think it's really remarkable that you can do this with which is two lines of code if you wanted to customize this map um more um I, I would recommend um, using the leaflet library, um, which is going to give you a lot more control in, in how this legend comes up and the types of things you, you want to display in your pop up message. But um, for just like that initial data exploration, I, I highly recommend using the TMAP library because it's just so quick and easy to make these really useful interactive maps. It, it's really helpful when you're trying to um, get a get a handle of your data to be able to just um, sort of uh, uh, hover around and, and see the names of, of the different polygons that, that you're um, sort of familiarizing yourself with. So one thing that, that might um, you might have already noticed is that we do have a missing value. Um, so if you were to look in the SF or the data frame of, of our Lime, um, we, we can do that right now actually. Um, so you can see, this is St. Lawrence County, um, and you can, um, when, when it's a data frame, it, uh, you can um, click um, in your data and, and view sort of the, the rows and columns. And if you look at St. Lawrence County, you'll see that um, we have some missing data. We have NAs, um, and what we care most about is the NA for the Lyme incidence rate. And the reason I point this out is um, <clears throat> further on when you're doing your spatial statistics, th there's lots of um, just little nuances with, with the way that um, different packages and functions are written. And some of them get really angry if you have missing values. Um, so part of data cleaning sometimes is going to be removing those NA values. And of course, it's very important to document when you do that. Um, but uh, while we're still, you know, sort of getting handle and clean our data, your analysis is not going to throw an error message. So, um, the the way that I do that um, was with this line of code, um, and I, I can kind of try to walk through what's going on um, with this code. So, when I'm trying to understand a line of code um, that has sort of a lot of embedded things in it. I like to go from inside out. Um, so uh, in this very deepest layer um, nested within, we see this Lyme um, variable. So this is a Lyme incidence rate in our um, Lyme data frame. And then this, um, useful function um, is dot na. And when you pass, so when, once you've um, selected this column by, by name, this line incidence rate, this is effectively a vector. And when you pass a vector into is dot na, it's gonna go through every value of that vector and tell you true or false is the value, is this element of the vector in a. So you can see that every of this vector Um, this value, which is um, associated with St. Lawrence County. Um, so you, essentially now you have uh, this vector, this Boolean vector of true falses uh, with one true value. Um, and you want to inverse this, which is what um, this uh, exclamation point does. So if we now pass the same code with a with an exclamation mark. Now it's going to flip it and, and you're going to have all trues except for this one false, um, which uh, at, at the um, position of St. Lawrence County. And then finally, um, when you pass this Boolean vector, um, 
in sort of this index bracket, what, what you're telling R to do is I want to select all the rows that are true. So we're essentially selecting all the rows um, for our Lime data frame um, that uh, have non-missing values for the Lime incidence rate. So what this is going to give us is it's going to give us the same Lime um, SF and data frame object. But now if we go back to Lime, you can see that um, St. Lawrence is no longer there. So, so we've dropped our our one um, our one row with with missing with the missing incidence rate. There, there's a lot of different ways to do this, but um, this is the one that came to mind when I was when I was writing this up. So I figured it was worth going over with you. Um, and now let's let's map our data again. So this is the same um, three lines of code as up here, um, but now because we've updated Lime, um, it should be a little bit different in terms of what output. Let's see what happens. Um, so it's just loading the interactive map. Here it is. Um, and you see that it looks almost exactly the same, but now when I hover over St. Lawrence County, um, nothing comes up because that polygon is no longer there. So it's the same object as before, but minus St. Lawrence County. Um, so you also note that um, before we had 62 rows and now this data frame has 61 rows, which, which makes sense. Okay, so now that we've sort of um, explored our data, cleaned our data a little bit, we're, we're ready to start our, our clustering analysis. Um, though <laughs> the first step of, of the analysis is sort of some data checks. Um, so uh, something that I haven't told you yet that I'm going to mention now is that the Moran's eye statistic um, is very sensitive to extreme values. So before you run a Moran's eye statistic, you should look at the distribution of the data variable that you're interested in. And if you see extreme outliers um, or just any strong departure from normality, transform your data. Otherwise, you might essentially be prone to getting false positives where you don't really have um, spatial autocorrelation, but because you have one or two really, really large values, it might be sort of artificially inflating your test statistic. So that's why, um, that, that's what we're going to do now. So some ways that we can look at the distribution of a variable um, with the summary function. Um, so this, this is sort of our variable of interest, long incident rate. Um, this column in the, the Lime SF frame. And if we run the summary, number summary, the minimum value, the maximum value, as well as um, the first quartile, the median, and the third quartile, and the mean. So if you look at sort of the value of your median and your mean and your third quartile and how much larger your maximum value is. It's already, I should already be sending me some low flag that, that something might be up with your data. Data with, uh, with the hist command pop up down here. Um, and you can see, wow, okay. So, you know, the, the bulk of your values are, are going to be between zero and a hundred um, rate per a hundred thousand individual. But then you have sort of this very long tail um, where you also have in some counties um, line. In so, so this distribution is very strongly skewed right or skewed. Um, and just for fun, we'll also do a box plot. Um, which is going to show you the same thing, that you have a lot of extreme outliers um, that are much larger than, than sort of the other values. Um, and so because our data is skewly, <laughs> strongly skewed, um, and, and when you have very positively skewed data, a few different transformations that you can consider. 
um, but one that works well for, for our data is we can just simply find the log of it. Um, so let's, uh, let's do that now. To create a new column, a new data frame um, called log Lyme incidents. And we're just gonna find the log of, of, our, of our variable of interest. And let's see the histogram of our log transformed value. And you can see this looks much better. This looks much closer to normal. Um, and our box plot um, also looks much better. It's much more symmetrical. So um, I, and just sort of as a sanity check, we can once again map our, um, our log transformed values. And so that. And um, the, this map looks um, very similar to the map before in that um, before, you know, the, the very, uh, the areas of, of very large incidence rate, so the area is very suspicious of being a hotspot for Lyme incidents, um, has not changed, which makes sense because log transforming your data is not going to change the rank um, of, of these different variables but it's just going to change how extreme the extreme values are. So now this, these extreme values are, are closer um, to sort of the, the other less extreme values, um, which, which the Moran's eye statistic is going to handle better. And OK, so now, now we're done with, with our data cleaning. Um, and, and the first step of the analysis itself is to um, define neighboring polygons. Do that uh, with the spdep library. Um, and the function that we wanna use is poly2nb. So this essentially stands for polygon object, uh, which um, our SF object you know, contains spatial attributes. So it's gonna, that, that's gonna be this poly to NB and NB stands for neighbor um, and it's it's um, well let, let's take a look so poly to NB we're going to feed it um, our Lime SF object and um, an option that you um, you need to specify with this poly to NB command it's by the way this poly to NB function is for um, finding contiguity based neighbors which is that that first very intuitive case where um, any uh, uh, the neighbors are defined as um, regions that share a border or a vertex in the case of, of queen, uh, a queen case contiguity based definition, which we're gonna select as true, um, for example. Um, and so when we uh, run this poly to NB function, um, we, gonna, um, we can take a look at class and it's an it's an NB object. So this is this is a special data class um, from the SPDEP library, um, and it's it's how the SPDEP library stores um, information about neighbors. So let's just um, do a quick some quick exploration of this NB um, object that we created. Oh, so this is a typo. <laughs> I'm sorry, catch this now in this live section. So this should be the name of NB with Lime underscore NB. I'm going to save that now. So um, the next time you open this up, if you're on Studio Cloud, you, you won't have this error. Um, you can run this. You can run this line of code. Um, and you can see that it's a list of 61. So an NB object, essentially, it's just um, a, a list of this is going to be associated with your polygons. So remember that um, we can write in the console dim of our dimensions for our line data is um, 61 rows. So that's that's how many counties we have. Um, so it makes sense that we have a list of 61 vectors and each vector um, is going to list 
the index for each one. So let, let's, I'll show you what. Um, recall that when, when you're a subsetting from a list versus from a vector, when you subset from a vector, you can just use a single bracket. But when you subset from a list, you need to, you need to subset using a double bracket, which is what I'm doing here. So we're going to take the first element or the first vector in this list, and it's going to return um, a vector of, of these values. So what, is, what do these values mean? If we take these, as so I already told you what, what they mean, they're, they're indexes. They're, they're the indices of um, the neighbors for this first polygon. So we can find the names of, of these neighbors if we take, um, okay, um, if we, well, first let, let's find the name of this first county. So Albany, the first county is Albany. Um, so this vector, this first vector um, from, from our NB object is all the neighbors for Albany. And we can find the names of all the neighbors for Albany. If we um, take this vector, we plop this into this, in, um, in, into, um, into this uh, bracket, and that's gonna pull the names of the neighbors of Albany. Um, so Columbia, Green, Rensselaer, Saratoga, Shenandoah. Okay, I won't try to pronounce the last two. Um, if you're familiar with New York State geography, you might already be convinced that these are the neighbors, but we can do a quick check. Um, I believe Albany, I thought I knew where Albany was, but I guess I don't. Let's see, Albany, oh, there's, there's Albany, okay. And our, the neighbors we would expect to have is the name I couldn't pronounce, Montgomery. Um, the other name I couldn't pronounce, Green, Columbia, Rensselaer. So yeah, so it is indeed, um, these these counties. So so that's um, what's going on in in this NB object. So now we figured out who who the neighbors are um, for each polygon. Um, the next step is to um, assign weights to the neighbors. So the idea is you want to assign some non-zero weight to the neighbors, and then the weights for non-neighbors are just going to be zero. So you're only going to care about sort of the covariance um, between sets of neighbors, and, and you're, you're going to weight zero. You're going to not include, essentially, in your summation of the covariance of the Moran's I statistic, um, all those non-neighboring polygons. So when we're assigning weights um, using the SP depth library, we can do so if we already have an NB object. Um, with this function nb2 list w. Um, and what this what this function, um, what you input into this function is our nb object. And then the style, um, the, the way that we're going to assign the weights. Um, and sort of the simplest way we can do this is to assign equal weights to, to neighbors. Um, and, and I'll show you what I mean by equal weights. But yeah, let's go ahead and, and run this line of code. Um, so now we're going to store our weights um, into this um, object that I'm, I'm naming line weights. And let's see what the class of this object is. OK, it's a list W class. So the W stands for weight. And um, we can run the stir command again. So I already wrote that up here. So let me first show you what happens if I, if I just run stir like that, it's going to be um, quite a lot of output that's sort of hard to wrap your mind around. Um, so one way that makes it easier to view if you have sort of a complicated list within list situation, um, you can write maxed level one, and that's only going to give you that first layer um, of, of sort of the structure of your object. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, and now you can see this is a little bit easier to read. So it's a list of three different things. Um, the first thing, the first element of this list is the style. So that, that's just saving that we, we selected W or equal weights. The second thing is actually our NB object. It's going to be that list of 61 vectors um, where with each vector um, containing information about the neighbors for each polygon. And then what we actually care about, the weights themselves, um, is, is this third element of, um, of this 
list W object um, down here. And so we can, we can access that third element of, of our list. Um, we, so when, when you have a list that, that where the elements are named, you can um, call a, a specific element the same way that you'd call a column in a data frame. You can use sort of a dollar sign. Um, so we can access these weights um, by with the dollar sign weights. And, and that's going to output um, sort of all our weights together. And if we wanted to, to um, see our weights for our first polygon, which again is, is Albany, we can um, use a double bracket because um, you can see by the way that this is outputting um, the, the weights that each of these um, numbers is a double bracket, which is telling me that this is a list. This is another list. So this is what I'm talking about, the list within lists. Um, so that's why I need to um, use double brackets to find um, the first set of weights, which is going to correspond to our weights for Albany. OK, and now this is now you can see what I mean by equal weights. So Albany, um, if, if you'll recall, and, and actually you don't have to recall, we can, we can check um, with code. Um, the neighbors for Albany um, are, are these indices or these names. And if you count, it's, it's six different neighbors. And so not surprisingly, you're going to have um, six weights and all the weights are equal. And um, if you're not good at mental math, which I don't think I am, um, each each one of these weights uh, is is equal to one over six. So um, for for this uh, for the way that SPDEP calculates weights, um, they want the sum of the weights for all the neighbors of any given polygon to equal one. So when you have six neighbors, um, the weight for each neighbor is going to be one over six. Um, and if we consider um, our second county, um, which is Allegheny, um, we can see that. Allegheny has four neighbors. Um, and if you want to see um, what the weights for these four neighbors are, it's 0.25 or one over four. So again, the weights are going to sum up to one. Um, so yeah, now, now we have um, defined our neighbors. We've assigned weights to, to neighboring polygons. And we're ready to to do the, the um, significance testing to test for global spatial heterogeneity. Um, and we do so, um, another, another function in the SVDEP library is the Moran.test function. Um, and what this is going to do, it's going to um, run an analytical test um, to, to calculate. So you're going to get the same Moran's I statistic um, in, in either case. So this is the Moran.test versus Moran.mc is going to, um, they defer in terms of how you're assessing your significance or how you're essentially you're calculating your p-value. Um, and without going into detail, um, I, I mentioned before that um, the best way to count, to, to assess for significance um, when it comes to the Moran's I statistic is to, to do per permutations uh, or simulations. Um, so the, these uh, Monte Carlo simulations is the best way um, to, to assess for significance and, and to calculate an accurate p-value. Doing it analytically, um, which is another way of saying like mathematically, um, it's going to be faster, but it's going to be less accurate. Um, so we're going to do both ways. Um, we're going to run the Moran test. Um, and so what you specify is um, the, your variable of interest, the weights, and then this is sort of the default, but um, I, I just wrote it explicitly anyway. Um, what, what this means is whether um, the alternative test that you're, you're testing for, whether it's you expect the Moran's I statistic to be greater um, than under the null um, hypothesis, which is um, equivalent to positive spatial autocorrelation. 
if you are for some reason, which I, I don't think you will be given um, your interest by being on this call, um, if you were interested in testing for negative spatial autocorrelation, you would write uh, less. Um, or you can write um, two-sided if, if you, you think that there's any chance that, that um, there's a negative spatial autocorrelation. But uh, we're going to stick to the default behavior. And like I mentioned, um, when it comes to health data, you're, you're typically dealing with positive spatial autocorrelation. Um, so, so we're going to keep sort of this option as greater. I just wanted to give some, some background about what that means. Um, and so we can see that our Moran I statistic, which was calculated using the formula that, that we briefly went over on the slide, it's going to equal 0.72, but of course that means nothing um, without looking at our p-value. Um, and you can see that our p-value is, is very, very significant. But like I said, the the analytical test, it sometimes gives an overinflated um, value of significance, so like an overly small p-value. So we can compare um, this result to the result that we get from our Monte Carlo simulations. Um, and so what you input to the Moran.mc function um, is going to be pretty much exactly the same, except in addition to these options, you also need to sim uh, specify in sim. So that's going to give you the number of simulations to run. So um, essentially you want to pick a large enough number, but not like a million, because otherwise it would take forever to run. Um, so like about 999 or 1,000 is, is, a, is a pretty um, good intermediate between those extremes. Um, and we can calculate Moran.mc, um, and you'll see why, but I will save the output. Of, of this test, um, and we're gonna name that MC. And before we look at the output um, of this test, I wanna point out that um, the way you calculate a p-value uh, with Monte Carlo simulations is that essentially you're gonna have 999 iterations or simulations, and you're going to have um, you know, that, that, that you simulate under the null hypothesis of no spatial trends. And so you're going to get a distribution of Moran's I statistics. Um, and you're going to compare the Moran's I that you actually got from your data to the distribution that you got from your simulations. So because we have an N sim equal to 999, um, the most extreme p-value that you can get is essentially 0 0.001, that your your um, Moran's I statistic is greater than all 999 simulations. So with that being said, let's look at our results. And you can see our point value is 0 0.001. So I, I just point that out because that, that's not to say that our p-value wouldn't be higher. I mean, if, if you, I haven't done this, but if, if you're curious, you can um, increase this in sim and see um, if, if the p-value um, gets any smaller, but the number of simulations essentially puts a cap on how tiny your p-value can be. Um, so hopefully that that makes sense. But if not, it's kind of just a a random side point. Um, and the reason I saved this output as MC is um, SPDEF has a, a, a really nice um, the the way it outputs the this value is you can just uh, feed it directly into the base plot function. And this is doing what I what I said. So um, this function, um, it uh, made um, 999 iterations that it simulated under the null hypothesis where the incidence rates are, are um, homogeneously sort of distributed across our study area. Um, and it, it made this distribution and you can see our outlier, oh, I'm calling it outlier because it, it looks very much like an outlier. Um, you can see that our test statistic is well outside the distribution. So, so my suspicion is if you were to increase the number, this in sim, you're going to get a, a very, very small key value. Oh, I have a question. Ah, good question. So is the MC method still feasible if you have a large number of observations? For example, all census block groups in a state 
are there any rules of thumb? Um, so I, I think I think the MC method is absolutely feasible, even if you have a large number of observations. It's it's just a matter of how long you're willing to wait. Um, I, I don't think there are any rules of thumb. If it's something you're you're very curious about, like it's the main result of your paper, and you don't mind waiting, oh I don't know, like two days. Um, I you know I I've, I've waited for code to to run for that long. Um, I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to do so. Um, yeah, I, okay, excellent, I, I, good, good luck. Okay. And before we move on to um, local tests of spatial clustering, we're going to take another break. Um, let's do another 10 minutes and we're probably gonna get out an hour or more early because I, I don't think we have um, that much longer to go, but please take a break and, and get a snack and go to the bathroom. Um, and once again, um, feel free to, to leave messages in the chat and we can start with questions if, if there are any. Okay, um, let's, let's get back to it. Um, so I, I was following the chat um, and I don't really, I've, cluster computer, um, but I, I've never used the do parallel um, a library for, for any analysis, but, but I imagine if, if you did have a problem with with code taking a long time to run um, because, because you're running simulations, um, that it, it could be helpful to speed things up. Um, Um, data set and and running so many simulations to really take days. My my um, example of take days for code was compiling a large county statistics. It was it was just rendering a very, very large file in a very specific way. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say it's pretty rare that that things really do take days. And, and a good strategy is to start with a very low um, in sim. Um, you can start with like a hundred. It's not going to give you um, uh, very robust results, but but it's it's just a nice check to see that your code's working and 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 to give you an estimate of of how long it would take if, if you were to increase the number of simulations. Um, so yeah, great great um, questions, everybody. And we can go now to um, talk about. Uh, our, our local um, significance tests. So um, assessing local trends, I just have a few slides on this. Um, so speaking generally, the general um, term for a lo local tests of, of spatial association is um, LISA, which stands for Local Indicator of Spatial Association. So the number of LISAs um, and what they have in common is that they provide um, so a, a test statistic for each location um, that, that you're considering. So if you're working with polygon data, you're going to have um, a, a statistic for each one of your polygons. Um, and along with the test statistic, you're, you're also going to have some measure of significance or like a pseudo p-value at each, each location at, as well. And because you have the, these, uh, these statistics and in, in measures of significance um, across your study area, it allows you to actually identify specific disease clusters. Um, and because we already talked about the Moran's eye statistic for our test of global trends, um, it's uh, maybe a nice extension to, to for our LISA, we, we can choose the local Local Moran's eye statistic to talk about. Sausage, what are you doing? I think she's hungry. Sorry, guys. Um, so I have a question. I see a question in the chat. Um, did I read this question? Oh, okay. No questions. Let's move on. So the local RAI statistic, um, this, if, if you recall our, our uh, formula from earlier, it's, it's very similar to global Moran statistic. 
except um, instead of having sort of this double sum, um, you have your your I term um, outside the summation because you're going to calculate this for each one of your regions. So we're going to call each region region I. Um, and essentially, you're going to have um, you're going to find your neighbors again. You're going to use the same weights um, that that you used before, and you're going to uh, weight your neighbors. So the neighbors for for polygon I, you're going to see um, if if your your deviation from your mean is high for um, your 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 polygon of interest then um, this local Moran's I statistic is going to be high if the neighbor's values are high as well. So it, it's um, uh, just a, a nice extension of, of the Moran's I test statistic that we've talked about. Um, so like I already said, the local Moran's I statistic um, is going to um, also include a measure of significance, and we call this a pseudo p value um, because it's it's not this this p value, this you know this measure of significance on its own that you care about. So we, that's what we call a pseudo p value, and we're going to have a pseudo p value for each polygon. And um, so a polygon with a high, and, and we're going to um, we're going to uh, judge how high, how, how significantly high um, a local Moran's I value is based on the pseudo P value. Um, and, and it's going to be high, like I said, when you have a high disease counter rate that's surrounded by other polygons with a high disease counter rate. And a polygon um, with a low value is one with a low disease counter rate that is surrounded by other polygons with a low counter rate. Um, and so when you have um, a high, so high with a pseudo high pseudo p, or sorry, a high with a with a with a small pseudo p value, surrounded by other um, polygons with a high local Moran's I statistic with a low pseudo p value. We're going to call that cluster um, a high high cluster, and and we can all another way um, another another name for this would be a disease hotspot, and. Um, Sort of on the other side, if you have a significantly low um, valued polygon surrounded by other significantly low valued polygons, then um, we call this a low low cluster, and it indicates that that cluster is um, where the disease incidence is lower than one would expect under the null hypothesis of, of no um, spatial trend. Um, so let's uh, go to our workspace again, um, and, and we have um, some code to run that, that's going to show us how we can do a local Moran's eye um, in R. We left off. We're um, on line 262, 266. Um, so the way that we do a, a local Moran um, is we're actually now going to use a different library um, because right now with the SF, um, uh, with SF objects, you can't do local tests um, with with the SB Def library. So this this package came out like just last year. It's still being updated. It's it's still very much in the early stages. Um, when I was going by um, some documentation that I found that came out just a few months ago, I saw that some of the the functions had already changed names. So you know we're Um, so this is an, a nice library called rgeoda, um, and the the steps um, themselves in terms of what they're doing is going to be similar. Um, we're going to again we're going to need weights, um, but we're going to calculate them a little bit differently because we're using a different package. So um, let's let's start by loading rgeoda. 
Um, once again, we're going to find um, uh, queen case contiguous based weights, um, which with the RGO DAW library, um, we can find with the queen weights function. Let, excuse me one moment. I'm just going to um, remove my dog from this room so she's not making a, a racket. I apologize for that disruption. We can um, continue with where we were. Um, so we can find queen case contiguous weights um, using the queen weights function in the RGO library. And all we need to input into this function is our SF object. So um, like I said, RGO is brand spanking new and it's it's got some nice speed up and, and we'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. So um, we can store our, our queen weights. I'm just gonna differentiate um, the way we calculated weights um, using the SPDEP library. I'm just gonna name it a little bit differently. I'm gonna call it line G weights, um, G for geoda. And um, if we see what this class is, we can say that it's a, a weight um, object, um, which is a, a type of object from the RGODA library. So that's just what this information is telling you. Um, and once again, we can run our uh, our um, old faithful stir command, and we can see that it's class weight, um, and it's like, um, some. It's going to give us a nice summary of the weights. Now, um, this is telling. Um, it tells you the minimum number of neighbors. So minimum number of neighbors for our 61 polygons is one. Um, and there's at least one polygon with as much as many as eight neighbors. Um, our number of observations, the mean number of, of neighbors as well as the median number of neighbors. So this is um, a, a nice summary that, that you would need several lines of code to, to get this information. Um, using the, the SBF library. So once again, we can um, see the neighbors of the first polygon, um, so Albany County. Um, and the way that we do that um, for the RGO dot library is they actually have a, a function that, that they've already written out for you that lets you get the neighbors. So this is nice and clean. You don't have to index with double brackets and then single brackets. So that's what I mean by it being just a little bit more user-friendly. Um, so the way that what you input into the get neighbors function is you input the the weights the weights and you specify the index of the county that you're interested in. I wrote one here. So if we run this line of code, it's going to give us the index values of of the neighbors of Albany. Um, and once again, um, just, just remind us that, that the first county is indeed Albany. Um, we can just input this vector um, of indices um, directly into the single, into a single bracket. Um, and we can extract the names of the neighbors. And once again, we, we get these um, New York counties. Um, and I won't belabor the point, but you can do the same um, for Allegheny. Um, you can get the, the names of the, the neighboring counties, um, that neighbor Allegheny. Um, and you can uh, get the, the actual values of the weights using a similar function, just get neighbors weights. Um, and once again, you specify which um, polygon you're interested in getting the weights for. And you can see um, a difference between the the RGODA and the SPDEF library is that instead of um, the weights for, for each polygon summing to one, um, essentially the weights, um, sort of the default behavior um, is to assign weights equal to one. For, for every time you have neighbors, you, you weight it equal to one. Every time you don't, it's zero. So it's just a, a little bit different, but, but it's similar. So we had six neighbors for um, many so that's why we have um, this vector of, of six ones. And because we have four neighbors, we have of four ones. And then you can calculate your local Moran's eye statistic um, 
using uh, your, your GeoDAW weights. Um, so there is one quick um, data cleaning step. This is kind of weird. I, I wonder if this behavior is going to change as they continue to update this, this package. Um, but for whatever reason, vector format, which is if you were to feed Oh, I think my okay, sorry. It's just being a little a little bit laggy. Um, so if you were to just pass um, this, it's just a vector, um, but it really wants it like a data frame. Um, which, oh, it's, it's it's not showing you, but it's essentially um, going to be a one column data frame. Uh, we have a question. Okay, okay, I'm getting um, info that my internet is a little bit choppy. So I'm going to relocate. How is my video and sound now? Um, if anyone um, can, can give me some feedback in the chat, uh, I'll just wait before I continue. Okay, great. Let, let me know if that changes. <laughs> I, I can keep uh, moving closer to my router at home. Okay, so. I'm just going to continue with our example. Okay, so um, essentially, if if we're passing um, this vector into the as data frame function, you can see what the output looks like, um, and it's essentially just a one column data frame. So this is just a a persnickety thing about this local Moran function right now is that it wants um, our variable of interest not in vector format, but in data frame format, which is why there's this extra step here. Um, and the first argument that you pass to the local Moran function is going to be our um, our weights um, in that geoda weight format, which we stored as line G weights. So we can go ahead and run this local Moran function. Um, and we can see that what this outputs is is um, is a Lisa um, object in the RGODA package. And so this Lisa object actually has some nice features. Um, so recall that for a, a Lisa, so in our case, a local Moran's I, um, we're going to have a Moran's I statistic at each one of our locations, so each one of our polygons, and we're going to have a pseudo p value at each one of our polygons or e each one of our counties. Um, and we can access directly the, the value of our test statistic at each point and the p values or pseudo p values associated with them um, if we um, uh, use sort of this um, dollar sign, um, Lisa vowels. So, now we get a vector and each um, element of our vector is going to be a local Moran's I statistic that's um, sort of associated with each one of our counties. And then um, if we wanted to see the p-values um, for all of our different, um, for all of our different counties, we can do that with the dollar sign p-vals. And um, sort of the final step of our uh, of our analysis of local trends um, is we can sort of map um, the the results and, and see if we have any high high or low low clusters. And um, there are some functions in the um, RGODA library that that can help us with the with the plotting. So we can get the colors that we want to use for our maps using this Lisa colors function. Um, and I can show you what that output looks like. Um, and it's just going to give us um, uh, what we'll, we'll see what the colors look like, but it's going to give us the color of no association of uh, our high, high cluster and of our low, low cluster and all these other values. Um, I think these first two are 
high low clusters and low high clusters, which we don't see often again in, in public health data because um, they, they show up really when you have negative spatial autocorrelation. Um, and I don't recall what, what these colors are, but um, we can also get the labels that we want for our map. So we can see what this output looks like. Um, so like I said, um, these correspond to the colors. So the possible labels that we can have are not significant, high, high, low, 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 high, high, low. And so the other two I can remember were undefined and isolated. And then um, finally, we can run the Lisa clusters command. Um, and this designation is going to tell you um, for each one of our polygons, whether it's um, not significant. Um, so, so none of these sort of um, possible significant trends is represented by zero. Um, polygons that are part of a high, high cluster are going to um, be labeled one. And polygons that are part of a low, low cluster are going to be labeled two. Um, and so once we put all these things together in this plotting function, um, we can see our results. Um, and you can see, um, which is not surprising, um, if you remember sort of what we saw when, when we plotted the values themselves, that there was this area of much, much higher Lyme incidence um, sort of in, in this part of the state. Um, and indeed, this is a high, high cluster or a hot spot for Lyme incidence. Um, it was less clear just using the color scales that we were using, but, but there is, it turns out, a an area of um, like a, of a cold spot where um, we had a cluster of, of um, low incidence rates. Um, and it turns out um, this little corner, um, including New York City, which, which makes sense given, um, you know, the, the lack of exposure to, to wooded areas that probably New, York, New Yorkers um, experience that, that they are sort of in a low, low cluster or cold spot for Lyme disease as well. So that's really um, all I've got um, in for our practicum um, and and for our our files. Um, so I just want to end by by thanking you for for joining um, the workshop today. Um, and please, if, if you have any questions about spatial analysis, any any comments you want to share, um, feel free to email me. Um, and eventually, in the next day uh, or two, I will. Um, upload all the files from today, um, including some bonus code um, with ggplot um, sort of mapping in it. And I'll also throw in, why not, I'll throw in um, some leaflet, um, some like more custom interactive maps that you can play with as well. Um, and please let me know if you have any questions you want me to answer right now. Um, I'll, I'll stay on for, for a few minutes if, if you want to. Um, Ask me any questions. Thank you. Ah, excellent question. Um, any book recommendations for further reading? Um, I don't really have like a favorite. I'll, I'll let you like I'll tell you what I what I go back to, and I don't think it's because I think it's the absolute best. Um, textbook out there, but it's just what I learned with, so I'm just familiar with um with the content so the layout I sort of just know by heart um so my my go-to reference um I'll share with you Lance Waller this book Ah, uh, yes.
Oh, um, a question about diseases and topics that I research on. So I um, completed my dissertation not too long ago, um, looking at um, the environmental um, and social drivers of asthma exacerbations in adult patients seen um, by Penn Medicine. And um, that was really fun because I got to integrate um, electronic health record data with publicly available data sources on like SES and um, pollution levels and things like that. And it, it really gave me um, the opportunity to, to pick up a lot of spatial skills. Um, and in my postdoc, um, I'm researching um, uh, one of one of my projects is is um, looking how at how we can improve um, rabies canine rabies vaccine uptake in Peru um, where they're currently experiencing a, a canine rabies outbreak um, and we're also doing some some other projects um, looking at zoonotic diseases sort of more locally but yeah that that's my um, um research area right now. Okay, if there are no more questions, I'm going to sign off now. Thank you all for your attention. And um, yeah, look out for these files um, on, on GitHub. And um, yeah, feel free to email me if, if you have any specific questions. Bye, have a good night.